I have to comment on this Titan story, this little MacGyver submersible vessel that went down to look at the wreck of the Titanic uh, and apparently imploded, killing all five people on board. Uh, we have the Navy has listening secret acoustic de detection system that they use for spotting enemy submarines and apparently heard this implosion on Sunday, as early as Sunday, but the search for the wreckage went on and we were held in suspense. So apparently the Navy didn't tell there anybody, we're not sure who they told or didn't tell. They finally leaked it to the Wall Street Journal that they have this capacity. Now there's a conspiracy theory going around that they did this to divert attention from Hunter Biden. I find that a hard one to believe, I think. They probably did it because they didn't want to reveal that they had this capability for listening. But I also think that it wouldn't have mattered because they had to search, just because they heard an implosion didn't mean that they knew this thing had gone. They were probably thinking, ah, oh, that's what that is, but they probably didn't know and they would have had to search anyway, so they kept their mouths shut. Still, it was you know, very tense and people were really taken up with it. And they, of course they were. There are some stories that defy reason, right? I mean, this is five people. We don't, we don't know them. It's not a million people. It's not a major disaster. But this is something, you know, when people dive to the bottom of the sea like that, it represents something in the human spirit that we cherish and should cherish, which is this desire to see and explore and know things. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite poems is a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson called Ulysses, which is about the final journey of Ulysses after he's come back and now he's a king and he's bored of being a king and he's an old man. And of course, for obvious reasons, I identify with this because he still has this taste for adventure and still wants to find things. And at the end of the poem, he says, he says, much is taken, much abides. In other words, he's lost a lot, but he still has a lot of energy in him. He says, we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Now, who can hear those words and not be uplifted, right? And not say, yes, that is what life is about, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And that's why these guys were doing it. You know, a little bit of a tangent, but still in keeping with the subject. One of the things I hate about artificial intelligence is that it may be artificial, but it's not actually intelligence. Because, for instance, artificial intelligence can collect data about somebody and the things they've done, and using an algorithm, it can determine that, oh, they're going to buy soap on Thursday. It might even determine that they're going to get married on Thursday. It might determine that they, there are certain things they like, of certain books they want to read, and all these things. But it can't know them. It doesn't know why it thinks that. It only knows that there's an algorithm that reveals that to them. And the people who are fascinated by AI, the kind of geeks and wonks who love this stuff, think, well, we don't need to understand. We just need the algorithm. All we need is the algorithm. That gives us the information we need. Well, no. I mean, the whole purpose of being a human being is to understand. It's to understand other people. It's to understand the world. What difference does it make if a computer comes up with an algorithm if it doesn't understand anything? It might be helpful to us. It might help us understand things, but it's the understanding, the knowing, the seeing that really matters. People compare AI to God because it works in mysterious ways that we don't understand. Well, it turns out then it's easier to make a God than it is to make a man, right? Because only God can make a man, but any man can make a God and worship an idol. So the people, the men on board the submarine is uh, Stockton Rush, who's the CEO of the company that built this little submersible vessel. He's 61 years old. Uh, there was a British-Pakistani businessman named Shahzata Daywood who took his son, Suleiman, 19. There's a British businessman named Hamish Harding. And a guy, uh, an explorer, 77-year-old Paul Henry Nargiolet, who's a French explorer. And he is kind of in this Ulysses mode that I was talking about. And they knew this thing was dangerous. This is a tin tub, like I said, it's like a MacGyver machine. Mike Rice was a guy who rode on the Titan before. He said this, is cut 16. On every dive we took, they lost communication. You know going in how very dangerous this is. No one walks into this surprised. Before you even get on, you sign this long, long waiver 
that mentions possible death three times on the first page. So you know what you're getting into. So there were people online who were making fun of these guys, were laughing at them when we didn't know whether they were alive or not. It was possible that they were stuck in this thing, losing air and in danger of suffocating. There's a way of making fun of tragedy that I understand. I've worked with cops a lot. I've been a reporter where you see a lot of tragedy. You see a lot of ugly things and you start to make unpleasant jokes. Cops make fun of, makes jokes about, I've seen cops make jokes about people who've been murdered. I see, I've seen reporters make jokes about disasters that have happened. Those are things that you do to keep your mind sane. So I'm not talking about that. I understand that people do that. But there was this other kind of ugly strain. My son, Spencer Clavin, no relation, wrote a, a really good article about this in the Washington Examiner. It was called Jeering the Titan, a culture that celebrates failure or only get more of it. And he quoted some of the tweets that went out Actually, it's funny when rich people die in a homemade submarine. Uh, I just know, there's another tweet, I just know those submarine rich guys were having sex with, cleaning up the language, having sex with each other when they realized they were going to die. Uh, Some people made fun of Stockton Rush, the guy who built the machine. Some people on the right made fun of him. Here's a clip of him talking about how he picked the crews, cut 15. When I start the business, one of the things you'll find, there are other sub operators out there, but they, they typically um, have uh, gentlemen who are ex-military submariners and they, you'll see a whole bunch of 50 year old white guys. Um, I wanted our team to be younger, to be inspirational. And I'm not going to inspire a 16 year old to, to go pursue marine technology, but a 25 year old, uh, you know, who's a sub pilot or a, a platform operator, one of our techs, can be inspirational. And so we've really tried to to get um, very intelligent, motivated, younger individuals involved because we're doing things that are completely new. We're taking approaches that are used largely in the aerospace industry is related to safety and uh, some of the the preponderance of checklists, uh, things we do for risk assessments and things like that that are more aviation related than um, ocean related. And we can train people to do that. We can train someone to pilot the sub. We use a game controller um, so anybody can drive the sub. So they're, you know, got this little MacGyver thing and they're playing with a game controller. And people are making fun of that. People saying you should have had some 50-year-old white guys in there to run the thing. But the main thrust of the attacks on these people were like this guy. And I, these are ordinary people. The thing about the internet, of course, is everyone can speak, which I think is a good thing, but it doesn't mean that everyone has something worthwhile to say. It just means that you can hear everyone. And here's a guy, we won't say his name, we'll just call him a moron, uh, who said this, cut 14. You know what makes me mad? There are 500 people missing in a shipwreck off the coast of Greece right now, and we are all talking about a couple of billionaires in a tin can. We are spending millions of dollars of taxpayer money to try to find this needle in a haystack. Meanwhile, we know where this ship went down, a proper rescue operation was not conducted, and now the Greek government is not even letting the survivors talk to journalists. And I can already see the comments like, oh, it's US money being spent on US citizens. But like, how much is a life worth? Because I think that's something we need to decide. Why do these people get tens of millions of dollars and rescue operations, but someone who needs like $20,000 for cancer therapy, yeah, we just leave them to die. It just makes me so f-ing sad that it's all about attention, which like, I'm a content creator, I get that, but people's lives should not depend on going viral. <laughs> moron. <laughs> now, first of all, this is wrong in so many ways, you know, I remember in the 1980s, I was a news writer then and radio, a little girl named Jessica fell down a well in Texas and the entire country came to a stop. The entire country came to a stop. There was something about that story. This little child stuck in this well. You could, they dropped a microphone down. You could hear her singing to herself to keep her spirits up. I mean, your heart, a heart of stone would have broken. You could have said, oh, you know, there's something else happening somewhere else. And there's, you know, certain things touch the human heart. And that's what this is all about. This is what life is about. It's about the human heart. It is not about anything else. It is about the need to explore, to understand, to know one another, to love one another. This is what we're doing here. It's not about AI figuring out things. It's not about, you know, oh, oh, this is unfair because we know things are unfair. And I don't know about this thing in Greece, but I do know 
how many times there have been rescue operations that were not about rich people, where the United States particularly has been involved, but also just heroic people risking their lives. You remember the uh, Haiti earthquake in 2015? We were involved in that. The rescue of the 33 mine workers in Chile is 2010, I think. They made a movie about it, the 33. I mean, these things were important not because those people were rich, the mine workers. I mean, what could be lower down the scale than mine workers? They were important because of the human drama and because people care about each other. And and this is a thing where we could all imagine ourselves, or we should have been able to imagine ourselves, into the situation of being stuck in this little craft with time running out. Now, thankfully, I guess we could say the implosion was probably pretty quick. They may have heard it creaking before it blew, but probably it was it was pretty quick. It was not the horrible death you can die in a submarine. But I think that Putting yourself in other people's shoes and stories that draw you into other people's lives are important not just in fiction but in real life, and they're actually humanizing. And I think that, uh, as Spencer says in his article, we want people to explore. We want people to dare. And sometimes only the rich can do that. Only the rich, you know, only Elon Musk can build rockets that go to Mars. It's I, you know, I, I do that in my bathroom, but it's not. They're not going anywhere. So. It's not a bad thing that there are rich people who do this, and it's not a, something that we should laugh about when they fail. I think it, this was, this, you can say this was adventure tourism, but even adventure tourism is an adventure. And if we don't have adventure in our souls, we don't really have anything going on. That's what this country has always been about. The people, it's like saying, oh, well, Daniel Boone got killed, or Davy Crockett got killed at the Alamo. He shouldn't have been there in the first place. This is a genuine this is a genuine corruption where people think their personal righteousness and their sense of fairness over, should overwhelm the human experience. I'm sorry this happened. It was a sad thing to have happened, but it was an ugly thing to watch Twitter react. If you want more great stuff, like and subscribe. And also, subscribe to The Andrew Clavin Show wherever you get your podcasts.